Hello, I'm coming to you with another story time from The Art of Being and Becoming by Hazrat Anaya Khan. I'm here on location in Washington Square Park, New York City. An incredible, incredible location. There's always something popping. There's always so much activity and excitement here in the summertime. So much going on. People playing chess. There's always some type of art. People are painting and um, playing live music and dancing. So it's a Sunday evening. It's sweltering here in New York City. It feels like 100 degrees. I can't stop sweating. I picked up a, um, a bubble milk tea from a place called um, Me Tea, M-I-T-E-A, right around here. I think it was on um, McDougal, maybe it was West Forth, not sure, but it's, it's in the vicinity of Washington Square Park. Anyways, let's get into it. I need to sip something because it is so sweltering. I love boba. All right, hopefully you can hear me fine. Let's get started. One may ask, if it is not conceit to try to be better than others, there are many thorns and few flowers. We should not try to become a flower in order to feel ourselves superior to a thorn, but only for the benefit of others. All that trouble and pain and difficulty should be suffered for others. If among so many thorns we turn into a flower, it should be for others. That must be the idea. Besides, it is not an easy task to become a flower. It is far easier to become a thorn. For one is naturally born a thorn, and one has to become a flower. It is easy to say, you have hurt me, insulted me, disturbed me, troubled me. But one does better to ask oneself if one has not harmed or disturbed someone else. One never thinks enough about this. Therefore, to develop personality, one learns self-effacement. It is an annihilation, a continual unconscious annihilation which turns the self from a thorn into a flower. <laughs> one may also wonder whether with the development of personality, one would not develop self-consciousness, but personality contains all, spirit, mind, and thought, and body. A self-conscious person is not necessarily one who has developed his personality, although development does sometimes give a tendency to vanity. But vanity is the power which can lead man either to good or bad. It is the living spark of the ego. The soberness of the ego is divine vanity, and the intoxication of the ego is the conceit of man. Conceit is difficult to conquer. It is almost impossible to get rid of. The reason is that wherever there is light, there is darkness. Wherever there is a form, there is a shadow. The word vanity is generally used in a very ordinary sense. There is no really good expression for the higher form of vanity. It is difficult to express this in any other way. The Hindus call it vairagya, and the Sufis use the word Kibria for divine vanity. It is God's creation in the manifestation which he wanted to create, but this is not the same as the satisfaction of the ignorant soul in its limitation. When it is in its proper place, it is divine virtue. When it is out of its proper place, it is sin. The understanding of vanity is the most fascinating vision of the phenomenon of life, and what the Sufi calls wine is the pleasure he derives from it. When this phenomenon is disclosed to him and he sees what activates all the different lives, it is almost like wine. What Omar Khayyam has called wine is the amusement one gets by looking at the phenomena of life, which lifts one above the worries of life. One will always find that the most evolved sages can be amused. That is why they are pleasant to meet and speak to. Worrying comes from self-pity and fear and fear is made of the clouds of ignorance. The light will dissolve it. Humor is the sign of light. When the light from above touches the mind, it tickles the mind, and it is the tickling of mind which produces humor. 
The one who develops his personality enriches and ennobles himself in manner, principle, and ideal. The subject has been much overlooked. It is not that man is not capable of it. Man is much more capable of it than ever before because he has to suffer so much. This life, as we live it, is a most painful life. It crunches and grinds a person, and in that way, can make him a better person. If he gave his thought to it, he would profit by it and become a better person. In ancient times, people willingly went through different sufferings, trials, and tests. Today, we do not need to do so. We have other trials. We do not need to look for them if we only learn to profit by them. Otherwise, this experience is lost. Nowadays, man can make use of all the skin and bones and nails of every animal in some way or another, and yet, we do not use our own life's experience, which is more precious than anything else. When people hear of an oil well or of a gold mine, they're all interested in it, but they're not interested in this gold and silver mine this mine of jewels and gems, the cultivation of which will produce all that can be produced. What is most valuable, they do not even think about. There is, however, no need to scorn a rich person. With all the money he has in the bank, his condition is sometimes much worse than that of the poor person. It is a mistake to say a person is rich because he has money or high rank. Besides, the question whether a person is rich or poor has nothing to do with personality. One can develop personality regardless of being rich or poor. Neither poverty nor riches necessarily draws one back from spiritual progress. For all that exists in the world is there for our use. If one has wealth, so much the better. If one does not have it, it is better still. The great gurus and teachers of all times have taught that to give one's thought and mind to the development of personality is of the greatest importance for those who wish to seek for truth. Part one, purification. Purity of life. Purity of life is the central theme of all religions which have been taught to humanity in all ages. Purity of life has been their central idea and they differ only in how they look at it. It seems that not only has purity of life sprung from religion, but it is the outcome of the nature of life. One sees it working out its destiny, so to speak, in all living creatures in some form or other. One sees this tendency in the animals who look for a clean place to sit and among the birds who go to a lake or river to bathe and clean their feathers. I gotta take a sip of my boba. This is like my new favorite drink. Hmm, so refreshing. I just love the taste and flavor of black tea. In humanity, one sees the same tendency even more pronounced. A person who has not risen above the material life shows this faculty in physical cleanliness, but behind it there is something else hidden. And that which is hidden behind it is the secret of the whole creation, the purpose for which the whole world was made. Purity is a process through which the life rhythm of the spirit manifests. It has worked for ages through the mineral, the vegetable, the animal, and the human kingdoms. Passing through and arriving with all the experience it has gathered, on its way at the realization where the spirit finds itself pure in essence in its pure and original condition the whole process of creation and of spiritual unfoldment shows that the spirit which is life and which in life represents the divine has wrapped itself in numberless folds and has thus so to speak descended from heaven to earth and its next process is to unwrap itself and that unwrapping may be called the process of purification. The word Sufi, which means unfoldment of the spirit towards its original condition, is derived from the Arabic word Safa or Saf, 
which literally means pure, i.e. pure from distinctions and differences. What exactly does pure mean? When a person says water is pure, he means it is not admixed with sugar or salt. It is pure. It is original. Thus a pure life is the term used to express the effort on the part of man to keep his spiritual being pure or free from all impressions of worldly life. It is the search for one's original self, the desire to reach this original self, and the means of getting to one's original self that really speaking are called a pure life. But this can be applied with the same meaning in any part of one's life. If it is used pertaining to the body, it means the same, that what is foreign to the body must not be there. This is cleanliness, the first stage of purity. And so it is with mind. When a person says pure-minded, what does it mean? It means what is foreign to the mind does not belong to it, but what is natural to the mind remains. And what is natural to the mind? What one sees and admires in the little child, the tendency to friendliness, readiness to see or admire something beautiful instead of criticizing, willingness to smile and answer to anybody's love or smile and to believe without questioning. A child is a natural believer, a natural friend, responding and yielding, a natural admirer of beauty without criticism, overlooking all that does not attract knowing love but not hate. This shows the original state of mind natural to man. After the mind has come into this world, what is added to it is foreign. It may seem good for the moment, it may seem useful for the moment, but still the mind is not pure. A person may be called clever, a person may be considered learned, a person may be called witty, but with all these attributes the mind is not pure. Beyond and above all this is the man of whom it can be said that he is pure-minded. Thanks for listening. May you find lasting happiness. Until next time. Goodbye.